Hi, good evening. Today is Monday, June 7th. S&P 500 closed down a few points today after an eventful narrow range around 15 point trading range day. And meanwhile, Nasdaq was a bit stronger and closed up almost 50 points, making it a new 20 day high. Nasdaq right now is only 200 points away from new all time highs, which is less than one and a half percent or around one and a half percent. While um, S&P 500, 500 is only 12 points away from all time highs. So while it all looks bullish and we're probably likely to make new all time highs in um, S&P 500 and possibly NASDAQ, uh, under the surface, I feel like there is a lot of um, uncertainties and risks. Uh, for example, the investor bear sentiment, the amount of bears right now is at the lowest uh, level uh, since 2018, since January 2018, according to uh, US investor sentiment. And that's when the sell-off happened. So while as a timing tool, it's not really a good indicator at all, it's just highlights the risks. And on top of this, it seems like Fed ha is withdrawing liquidity a little bit from the markets, which is also a negative. And we all know that the cash benefits that most of the folks were getting in, in US are also expiring very soon. Some of them already expired in around half the states and another half the states is uh, going to close the unemployment benefits pretty soon as well. So whether that will cause the market to sell off or not, it remains to be seen, but there are, there are certain risks uh, on the downside that we need to be aware of. On top of this, the taxation is currently being discussed between all of the uh, EU and, and US and major states where they want to increase the taxes on the major corporations. Mm -hmm. So that could put a squeeze on mm -hmm. profits uh, for all of the major NASDAQ companies because as the people spend less money and they're being taxed higher, their profit margins could be squeezed. So all of those things is a little bit of a red flag for this rally. I've, I've seen an interesting, we, uh, we were just talking about this, that I've seen an interesting change of leadership in the market. And it's, um, it's not, I'm not sure that it's bullish or, or bearish. It may signal that we're coming more to the end of a bull cycle is how I see it. And what that, what I mean by that is if you look at the, at the cyclical stocks, and I'm going to flip to a uh, daily chart here, that the cyclical stocks since February, uh, really since the start of February, have been the leader in the market. And um, there was this pullback here, and they, they're they not uh, pushing toward the highs along with uh, the NASDAQ and S&P. And um, it's not, not ordinarily bad. There's always kind of rotation in the market. That's not a bad thing, but uh, the but but we're seeing it across the board in these uh, cyclical names and uh, something like a, a crane. So this is more infrastructure, uh, and uh, so so um, energy continues to race higher, but we're seeing the cyclical stocks, these um, industrial cyclicals, start to cool off, and um, whereas we're seeing some of uh, these indicators of momentum start to pick up a little bit and maybe they're, they're not to the point where I would say they're the leaders, but they peaked out in February and pull way back and are coming close to a breakout point. And so what I would actually say is that, that these tend to be very late cycle um, leaders and that when you see all of these momentum stocks like the ARC or like Tesla, which has a similar looking chart, when they become the leaders again, then that's, start, that's time to start uh, moving toward the door <laughs> because it's, uh, it's a sign that there's um, just a desire for, um, for kind of quick gains uh, in, these, in these momentum stocks. And, and um, so it's not to say that it, they could take leadership, and if they if they're not making these you know 10, 20 percent rallies every day, then it could be a sustainable rally. But it's when 
that, that these sometimes tend to be the ones that rally very sharply. And I, I think that's a sign of the, the cycle getting a little long and the tooth uh, getting, getting old. Right. Plus, we, we have seen record inflow of cash into ETFs this year. Uh, for the first four months of the year, it was 180% higher than for the same period of last year. So record exuberance, record money inflow, rec- lowest number of bears in last, what, three years, four years. Uh, and on top of this, there is so much exuberance and risk taking in the crypto front, which we'll talk about later. And if that space, crypto space, sells off, it could cause a risk off event in the US market, uh, stock market as well, because it seems like the risk on risk off has been tightly woven between those uh, two separate markets. So, but we'll talk about crypto in a little bit. Meanwhile, today, small caps outperformed also. They were up one and a half percent and also very close to trying to break out. They have been trading in the range for a while since the beginning of the year about, right? And so we'll see what happens there, but they used to be the leader and now seem to be stuck in the range and trying to break out. And if they fail to break out, also could drag the markets low down. So th- there are all of those risks, but you know what they say, the bull market climbs the wall of worry. So, and, uh, but one notable uh, mover today was Biogen. Mm. which Andy is a perfect person to talk about. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, of course, it was the news that their monoclonal antibody, uh, which is going under the name of Adahelm, uh, kind of an odd name, but it's the first um, disease-modifying treatment that the FDA has approved for Alzheimer's. Everything that's on the market now is simply um, for managing symptoms to make... Uh, help someone maybe retain a little bit of um, mental clarity a little bit longer, but they, they wear off and then they stop working and they can actually speed the onset of further symptoms down the line. But, but this potentially could help some people. It's maybe not everyone with Alzheimer's, but some people. And, uh, and so, of course, uh, Biogen responded really nicely today, rallying nearly 40% or actually you know, something like 70% at one point. Right. Yeah. We were only about 10 points away from all-time highs today. Right. Uh, right. Which was uh, oh, prior to, and that all-time high was even prior to their spinoff of their hemophilia division. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, this, so, you know, it's, it really, it, if you adjust for that kind of like a split or spinoff, and it's it's pretty close to its all-time high, and uh, but this is um, I think actually quite bullish for for biotech in general because the FDA approved it on the basis of unmet need. Uh, the panel that was um, uh, recommend the the clinician panel they recommended not uh, approving it, and they based that on the fact that there was insufficient data to support it support its efficacy. However, the FDA seems to be shifting toward um, a mode where they're less um, concerned about efficacy, more concerned about uh, things like safety, but then also the unmet need, which I think is um, positive for patients in the sense that there's more treatments available. Whether or not you want to take it, that's up to you and your doctor, not direct FDA, right? And uh, so that's one, but then two, it's very positive for the biotech companies because um, especially uh, ones like a Biomarin um, uh, or some, some of the uh, gene editing stocks like Intellia uh, or Editas or CRISPR, some of these, um, they, they responded pretty nicely, but all of these, um, all of their drugs have a lot of risk um, because these are essentially like um, a custom built gene therapy for certain rare diseases where there are no treatments like hemophilia or something. And so, uh, but they could potentially cure hemophilia or some other blood disease, for example. So 
the 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 buy uh, biogen approval today was very good news for these stocks, and they've been um, rallying a bit. Uh, I've been watching them for breakout, but I think that uh, it, they've yet to break out. But I would I'm I'm watching them for a breakout somewhere in this area, and um, I'm looking just at the whole sector of uh, gene therapy, and then maybe some like Biomarin that have a more diverse portfolio, um, uh, but that have a more diverse portfolio that, that I think they're worth um, watching. So I'm not sure I got messed up, but, but this one is um, you know, kind of a broken stock and has been for a long time, but uh, it could, um, that's the, the name of the game in biotech is that they can easily recapture their past glory if they have one or two successful uh, therapies uh, that launch. So, so I, but I, I'd say biotech is is um, interesting now. Uh, the, w w is this bullish for for bio, uh, biogen stock? Well, that's an interesting question because I think that um, it depends on how much this drug is used. It would probably be priced pretty. Um, aggressively, but then on the other hand, how many patients are going to actually be on it? That's what it comes down to: is the um, what <laughs> revenue they're actually going to get from this. So it might just be uh, this sort of flash in a pan, like what we saw, you know, in, in previous instances. So, but but I think it's worth watching if you don't already already have a position. It may be worth watching, and it might be worth. Um, like getting a position if it's a really nice pullback, a pullback to the breakout, but I would be conservative with this because uh, there are a lot of risks in this um, new therapy. Right, but as Alzheimer's in this country and across the world keeps growing with the aging population, I've read a theory that Alzheimer's could be considered sort of like type three diabetes, mm -hmm. where there is a very strong, strong link between insulin resistance mm -hmm. and Alzheimer's. And uh, well, as I am biased to low carb diet, I think that that's one of the studies that needs to be performed. And as keto diet seems to be promising mm -hmm. uh, treatment modulation for Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, well, but, but actually that, if, if that hypothesis is true and actually argues in favor of adicanumab, uh, Biogen treatment because it what it it um, that hypothesis is based on the idea that uh, there's an inflammatory effect mm -hmm. of uh, this and it's the inflammatory effect of uh, diabetes or type X syndrome whatever that is uh, causing this uh, deposition of the plaque in the brain and therefore if we can um, it, by taking an anti-inflammatory that can actually penetrate the blood brain barrier, make it to the brain um, and be an antibody for these proteins that are um, like a, a, an, an inflammatory response to the injury, then it might help. But it definitely would have to be with, a, with the right diet and all those sorts of things. But, but, uh, but it could help those patients that are more susceptible. But it probably... It, will probably be useful only in a subset of patients. And I don't, I'm, I'm just basing that on the, the, the data that exists on this uh, amyloid, um, amyloid plaque as a, as a cause that there's probably a subset of patients that this will work in, but not, not in a general Alzheimer's population. But this getting approved, well, it will put uh, a lot of pressure on other pharma companies like say an Eli Lilly that have maybe put their Alzheimer's drugs on hold because they didn't see the, um, the, the chance of getting it to market. Like, why are we gonna spend another 300 million on this yeah. doing testing if we can't bring it to market, if FDA is gonna knock it down? So if they see this um, perform well, or at least minimally well, then they'll, they'll continue developing their drugs. And we'll, um, we'll see a lot more come to market in the next three years. Yeah, 
I sometimes wish that drug companies could patent diet because if they could, maybe they would actually do a test because reducing intake of carbohydrates reduces insulin resistance in 100% of humans who try it because mm -hmm. there's a very direct link. The more carbohydrates you eat, the, the higher your insulin spikes. And once you reduce it, the insulin spikes less, reduces insulin resistance and consequently reduces inflammation and all of the other downstream effects associated with it. But you know, people want to take a pill because it's easier than restricting when you what what you eat, and you know it is. Well, the uh, uh, so there was uh, just this last week there was um, a Novo Nordisk drug that is a it's called a clip, and it's been on the market for ten or so, or so years or no, more than that, um, let's say 15 years for um, type two diabetes. And it's, uh, but it got approved for obesity because it was noticed that patients that took this and, and patient, patients that take the whole class of similar drugs, so that this drug and competitors, that they, um, uh, that they lost weight. They lost like 20, 30 pounds. And because many of these patients with type two diabetes, they, um, they're overweight. And that's part of the reason why they got type two diabetes to begin with is because of their, um, I got central obesity that they, um, they lost some of that and they, if they could keep it off, they remain permanently healthier as a result of that. And so it's been approved as an obesity drug. Um, it's, um, uh, but, but that, um, but it has um, the effect of um, in increasing or decreasing the insulin resistance, increasing the body's sensitivity to, to insulin. Um, and so you need to produce less insulin and, and so on. Right, and so does exercise as well. I, you know, when people do resistance training or even basic walking, that also reduces insulin resistance. But instead during COVID and back to this again, we lock people in, in their homes. You cannot use the gym. You cannot walk outside. And so consequently, people end up eating junk food and not exercising, increasing their insulin resistance. And as we already know, that's a huge risk factor for COVID. But nobody wants to talk about uh, exercise or diet. Instead, all we talk about is vaccine. And yeah, I think uh, everybody that I you know, uh, met in person uh, recently, which you know, th with things reopening, they've all put on, you know, to make a bad joke, they've all put on the COVID-19, you know, yeah. they, they have like every single, I mean, including myself to some degree, you know, put on a few pounds, uh, just not, you know, not, not walking as much, not as active and uh, now really working hard to get it back off. But, um, yep. but the, the, so um, I, I don't mind, know if you mind if we change topics, but Sure, absolutely. Uh, and let, let's talk about Tesla quickly, as uh, it was up 1% today. And Wait, which one was this? Sorry, Tesla. Oh, Tesla, right, right. Yeah. There, there was an anonymous video. I'm not sure if you, if you have seen it. The anonymous hackers group apparently put out a video that targets Elon Musk, saying that narcissistic Elon Musk is desperate for attention. And they're calling for a war against him because of his crypto manipulation and of anti-Bitcoin stance and just in general crypto manipulation. And so um, they're saying that all he does is just profits from the government subsidies and that he will pay for making people lose money because of his crypto manipulation. I saw the video. I didn't see anything that was like new information. No, it wasn't. I, it, was, I, yes. it was all like, well, he's got... Uh, factories in China, and he's and he's uh, getting subsidies from the government. And well, we all knew that. I mean, we all. <laughs> um, I mean, that's. I mean, it may not be positive things, uh, depending on your perspective, but but uh, is, is just highlight what... that division. It highlights the division in crypto space that you were talking about. There's this tribalism, and I think Miami Conference highlighted that a bit as well. That there's division between Bitcoin and Ethereum and. DeFi and Bitcoin. Yeah, and I, I had mentioned, and we can post a link to this, that there was a, a, an article in um, Bloomberg today 
by Joe Weisenthal, who I, I wouldn't consider really a crypto expert myself. Uh, he does write about it sometimes and he's, uh, he's somewhat knowledgeable, but I think he's a bit of an outsider as well. And, um, and, but it had some good perceptions about or good uh, observations about the different cultures for Bitcoin and Ethereum. And uh, I, I kind of, I like, I liked the article and I do give, um, I like to give mainstream media credit when they publish um, an article that's a little bit uh, deeper than surface level on crypto. Uh, on the other hand, it kind of reinforces the tribalism a little bit. And so maybe that's a bad thing that I, I, um, I'd like to think that I, mean, I'm, I don't fit either one of the stereotypes and like, do I have to become more this way to be, uh, you know, to invest in Ethereum? I, I, I just, I'm, I'm not sure I like that idea, but uh, it's sort of like um, what the, the way that Weisenthal portrayed it, like Bitcoin are these, you know, this sort of anarcho-capitalist porcupine, you know, very adversarial. And the Ethereum culture is this, you know, sort of evolved, um, you know, uh, uh, like, and referring to if one of the founders, Vitalik Buterin, uh, that that he's a vegan and he, you know, has a keto diet and and so on, and uh, you know, contrasting that as if uh, these are really significant things beyond just you know somebody's preferences, but. Right. You know. And um, I've seen a tweet that during Miami Bitcoin conference, there was a plane flying over the beach saying, buy Ethereum, sell Bitcoin. And uh, there was a presentation during the conference as well saying that Ethereum is backwards. Yeah, it was, uh, there were several people saying something like that. Uh, I think it was uh, Floyd Mayweather, who I'm not sure that's the bo most bullish thing, you know, for because he was pumping like this Centra coin in 2018, when that was, it was just, a, you know, some sort of money making scam and uh, it wasn't really a legitimate development. But, uh, and I think he actually ran into some legal trouble because of that, the SEC actually, um, uh, because he didn't disclose his personal links to, or, or what his holdings are or whatever. But, um, the, the thing I, uh, I'm very concerned about with um, is with Bitcoin right now, and it's broken support. It's at this uh, low 34,000 level. It's, um, I, I would say it's kind of in a bearish place right now, and it would need to bounce uh, pretty nicely to get back above this support and eventually get back above this 42,000 level to really be bullish again. And, but breaking below this, as long as it was kind of bouncing around in here, I was happy to call it neutral and consolidating. But this is, um, you know, this was a pretty serious break today. And um, on, on the other hand, uh, Ethereum um, is above what I consider like the analogous support. And it's, um, it's actually, it's it's doing okay compared to compared to Bitcoin, but Bitcoin I'm a little concerned about it. It could bounce here. If it bounced here and got back above this, then it it, it could just be a kind of fake out move, um, which you, we often see in in crypto. So I wouldn't. Uh, it, it's something to watch. I think that the thirty thousand level thereabouts is a pretty critical level. That was the low of this um, move down. And if it can stay above that level, then it can resume its, its bullishness. But um, if, it, if it breaks it, it's most likely going to go down into the low 20s, at least, if not 20 itself. Right, but 20 was the last uh, top a couple of years ago in Bitcoin. Yeah, there's... It, it, so yes, yeah, so that was the the previous cycle top, or it was route actually like nineteen thousand eight hundred. It was just under uh, twenty, uh, so it could it could revisit that. Uh, that would be uh, if if that happened, then 
it's clearly um, the end of the cycle and we have to then rebuild, um, re re you know, find some kind of bottom and uh, have a new bull cycle entirely where um, although this is a really serious pullback and it would be definitely called a bear market if this were in the, the stock index, um, it's, it's still not out of the realm of normalcy for crypto, these, these crazy 50% right. pullback. So it, it's, um, but it, it does need, <laughs> it does need to rally from here or it's, it's over uh, for, for this cycle. And that's not to say long-term really long, but it's just that long-term becomes a further out time that is well, bullish. Trump uh, didn't help the matters today mm -hmm. saying that uh, Bitcoin is just seems like a scam. I don't like it. I want the dollar to be the currency of the world. Well, I would just say that, that, um, you know, I, I, I don't know why he has to defend the establishment after everything they did to him. You know, why does, why does he have to stick up for the financial establishment? They weren't his allies at all uh, during his presidency or uh, before or after. So, um, yeah, surprising. Yeah, it's, it's, it's um, like, like not knowing, you know, if, if, if he had, had, it would have surprised me actually if he had stood up for something like Bitcoin, but it, it could be a, um, uh, you know, it, it would it would align them with people that are already predisposed against uh, you know, certain political or economic elites, but but he, he chose to defend the establishment, so to speak. Well, I think the whole conference, Bitcoin conference in Miami, was a disaster, to put it mildly. Uh, Max Kaiser, the guy who was presenting a lot on the stage frankly seemed like a drugged out lunatic and then later well we all know that el salvador president now announced on twitter that el salvador is going to adopt bitcoin as legal tender mm. which of course raises lots of questions uh for starters wasn't the main point of bitcoin to circumvent the government just to be this completely unrelated to the government uh, currency why does it need to be legal tender for el salvador well okay so there's there's definitely two um viewpoints on that and i would say that some of the uh leading uh bitcoin advocates are believe in what's called hyper bitcoinization and uh what that means is that they um think that that it should replace traditional currencies. Now, El Salvador got rid of, they used to have their own currency, the Cologne, and right. they got rid of it, uh, I'm going to say, eight or nine years back, uh, and just used the dollar, US dollar, as their currency, right? And, and so, uh, but what I think a lot of um, people that are Bitcoin advocates have pushed for for years is for Bitcoin to be taken seriously as a reserve currency. And that it could eventually, for some countries, like say in El Salvador, maybe not the United States, but for some countries like El Salvador, where they're a smaller country and um, they have, um, like, because they're using the dollar, every, like, just the supply of currency is de so dependent on their um, import and export economy, right? So if they, if they run um, a trade deficit with the United States, then all of a sudden they have fewer dollars in their whole financial system. And there is a deflationary pressure because they have a trade deficit and on and on. So there's all these problems. So what, what, what um, they, some people have made the case for is that well, for a country like El Salvador, it could be a great um, way to have a, uh, an ex, let's say an accepted currency that is independent of the United States and its policy decisions and it's the trade deficit with the United States and all these things. So there are definitely people that have advocated for that. Now there are these, there's another school that might say, well, you know, it should be like gold where it's independent of the government. It's um, stateless currency. And, and so that there's 
two schools on this. There's not. But then you're talking, if, if they're talking about got, making it legal tender, they're basically giving Bitcoin, be, giving the government control of Bitcoin. To me, that's completely, I, I don't see the second school. That's, to me, that's completely antithetical to Bitcoin. If you give the government control, especially El Salvador government, who is a known dictator, at some point he made the parliament pass the law literally at a gunpoint. He brought an army into parliament and made them pass the law. So I'm sure he can make them pass Bitcoin as legal tender as well. They do what he says. So do, I don't understand why is Bitcoin community celebrating association of Bitcoin with the dictatorship. And uh, I, I would say this, it's just like, okay, so legal tender doesn't, it, it, it means two things. It means one, that it can be used to pay any debt, right? And two, that it, um, yeah, so yeah, an accepted medium of exchange. So if if you if you're uh, do any kind of lending, make any kind of loan, then you have to accept payment in Bitcoin. If, if assuming this passes, which I think is just a proposal, right? But but the um, it doesn't mean that there can't be other forms of legal tender like U.S. dollar or whatever. It just means that it's among the proper legal tenders. Um, but there's um, I, so the, the question is though there's there's a lot of countries maybe like in El Salvador but I would say more specifically like countries like Russia or even Iran where they um, for whatever reason they they don't want to have to use the dollar as their main reserve currency they would and and by the way like Russia they don't want to have the euro as their reserve currency either. So what do you back the ruble with? Well, you, you can back it with gold, uh, other precious metals. Uh, Russia produces a lot of those, uh, but you could um, back partly with Bitcoin. The largest bank in Russia has a very big Bitcoin position, something like 100,000 Bitcoin, spare bank. And uh, they have for years in their uh, CEO is a big Bitcoin person or a crypto person. Um, but but um, I, I would just say that um, there's, there's different countries who for different reasons might decide to accept it as um, a legal tender, much, much like, you know, I'd say Russia could do that with gold, just as almost a gimmick where nobody would actually pay a dollar in gold or very few people. But the fact that you could, um, it, it, it could actually prop up the currency to some degree, prop up the sense that the economic system is solid or backed by something. But, um, but I, 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 I actually see it as mixed. I, I think I, I, I'm willing to wait to see what, how that transpires. And if it actually passes, it has to pass. Uh, like, I, I think it just has to pass the, their parliament or their assembly to actually become law. But uh, I'm, I'll be interested to see what, what happens with that. It, it could be both a positive and negative at the same time. But I, I think that the, the, the reason why some of the Bitcoin people are very positive about that is that it just, it sort of adds this further legitimacy to the, um, to Bitcoin. Right. Uh, it's, it's still, if the government wants to legitimize it and legalize it, the government will control it. To me, that takes away the main benefit of Bitcoin being more independent. And so if the government starts con controlling it, that's we're back again. What does it matter if it's Bitcoin or US dollar if the government controls it? And I wonder if this is more of a negative for Bitcoin, even though it's fun like positive, because the US government actually is going to take Bitcoin a lot more seriously right now, given they don't want the dollar to be replaced. <laughs> Obviously, like Trump said, they, they don't want the dollar to be replaced by Bitcoin. So I wonder if they will produce some more regulation or punish Ecuador in some way for doing that, if this will pass the government. Well, the El Salvador GDP is, um, it, it is uh, let's see, most recent was, uh, I can find it. It's about 26, 27 billion a year. Bitcoin market cap is um, just under, well, more like 800 billion. Okay, so 
the Bitcoin market cap is is something like um, you know for yeah, blah blah blah. So it's you know 30, 40 times um, El Salvador's whole economy. And so I, I, I don't think that they would have a significant, um, it, I don't say not a significant effect, but it's just, they're not going to control it. It's, it's way bigger than their economy. Um, now, if it were the United States is going to make illegal tender, uh, you know, that would have all sorts of ramifications, but I don't, I don't see that happening anytime soon. I think that, um, I, I think what's what's interesting is um, you know the some of the people that were um, you know, Trump's advisors that were actually the ones that were spurring them toward a more populist um, approach in and politics. They were they they're all still very big uh, advocates of cryptocurrency, not just Bitcoin. Uh, whereas the people that were um, urging him to always make peace with the establishment were the people that were very against it. And for whatever reason, he chose to listen more to the people that favored the establishment on this issue than the people that were more populist. Because I'm not to say that populists all have to be for cryptocurrency, but it's definitely a from the ground up uh, movement. It, it wasn't created by a central bank or even by any bank. It was created by people that were upset about the bailouts and the way that the U.S. government was handling the financial crisis. And that it was just endless bailouts for these, these banks that then had no consequences. And they go ahead and pay huge bonuses to their staff, despite losing trillions of dollars on paper, right? <laughs> so he, for whatever reason, he's, he, he's decided to, that he, is establishment people are, are right and not the more populist advisors. Uh, but but there's um, there's that kind of tension um, all throughout the, um, uh, I'd say among policymakers. I think there are, there are uh, definitely congressmen who are in both parties, by the way, who are, who are very much for and very much against uh, crypto and either want to clamp down or expand uh, the expand its use. So it's, it's, it sort of cuts across political lines right now. And um, there, there are people in the Biden administration who like Gary Gensler, who's the head of, I want to say the SEC, SEC, Gary Gensler, he was CFTC um, uh, under Obama, but, but he's spoken favorably about, about Bitcoin. And, and crypto in general. And he was the one who said that neither Bitcoin nor Ethereum are uh, securities. He said that previously when Obama was still president. So, so I, I think that um, it's, I, you know, I, I didn't see that as particularly concerning. Um, and I actually thought it was kind of like a gratuitous, gratuitous comment. And if he were president, that could have some consequence, but uh, he's not president. So what, why does he need to comment on these on on markets? You know, if Tesla stock went up two hundred percent in one day. What do you feel? I need to comment on that. I mean, I, I don't know. It's um, uh, it kind of a uh, kind of puzzled me that those comments. Right, I I agree. And uh, Max Kaiser is well. The the president of El Salvador said that please come move to my country. We have great. Uh, oceanfront property, you don't have to pay any property tax or Bitcoin tax or any crypto tax, uh, capital gains tax. But, and Max Kaiser, this crazy guy, he said that he has already bought a house in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. Of course, it didn't take people on Twitter too long to figure it out that the house he was referring to is actually in Costa Rica, Costa Rica and not El Salvador. So no, I, <laughs> I just don't like on Bitcoin, to, to me, that's why I'm saying that the conference was a bit of a downer for Bitcoin, because when you have Bitcoin associated with crazy characters like that, like Max Kaiser, who says, F Elon, we're not selling, I'm buying a house, lying about it. And just in general, his performance on stage, ripping US dollars and 
behaving like a lunatic, it and the, then you associate Bitcoin with it, and you see, is this really the future that we're looking forward to? So, well, I think uh, that that uh, contrast. Okay, so keep this in mind and contrast it with uh, with the um, Ethereal conference, which is uh, coming up here later this month, and uh, or actually happened already. But then there's another one a little bit later this summer, and contrast it with that, where it's very um, kind of nerdy. I mean, it's kind of <laughs> kind of like a big a big nerd fest where people will get up and talk about this or that app or this or that improvement that they're developing and actually things that will make it better. And um, and it's interesting to watch. I might not get all of it. Some of it uh, kind of sails over my head, but it's it's very interesting to see uh, kind of the, the, the people that are working on something that you have an investment in like crypto where it's um, it's not like a stock where uh, the, the company is going to keep their brightest people uh, kind of behind the scenes and put forward a CEO that's very a very good communicator and uh, can encapsulate things very well for a non-technical audience. Whereas with the crypto where there's not a CEO and you have this kind of unedited uh, style. But Well, Mark Saylor is another one. He's the CEO of MSTR, MicroStrategy, and they just announced that they're borrowing another 400 million to buy even more Bitcoin, mm. which I always found a bit confusing because if you're in the business of producing something, you should be investing in your own company, not into Bitcoin. Otherwise, you're saying your company has no value and all you care is just investing in Bitcoin. In Bitcoin. And now as a result of the financial accounting that we have, they have to realize, or not realize, they have to project a almost 300 million loss on their next earnings simply because of their large Bitcoin position. So it just makes his company look not necessarily in a, in a bad, good light. Well, I'd say though that they would have to do that if, well, they might have to recognize something. It wouldn't, uh, I don't think it's the same as a loss because uh, Bitcoin is not considered a currency in the sense of like having a mark to market. But they they would have to. There is something that they'd have to do to to recognize the change. Well, I'm not an accountant, but what I read because Bitcoin is considered indefinite lived intangible assets. Right, that's so right. They that's have right. to write down the value. So they have to, yeah, they have to recognize the goodwill or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so that's, the, like, that's what I mean. That the Bitcoin associated with Mark Kaiser was with with this kind of. Uh, entrepreneurship where you don't invest in your own company but speculate in bitcoin and then on top of this jack dorsey of twitter uh, over the weekend said that i don't think there is anything more important in my lifetime to work on than bitcoin so to me that's yet another scary thing about bitcoin i really don't want twitter jack dorsey to be involved in bitcoin given how much censorship he already does on twitter and how he bans anybody. So now he's gonna create some Bitcoin application that he's gonna be able to ban people as well. I mean, th that's what I mean. The Bitcoin is now in my mind, and I could be way off on this, but in my mind, Bitcoin is associated with a dictator, censorship, a, a crazy person, <laughs> and a bad businessman. That's the way I see Bitcoin. And obviously I'm wrong, I'm sure, but it's just an association. Well, it's, um, I, I tell you this, that um, my observation about what you were just saying is I, um, I'm, I'm interested to see, see, I, I tend to think that, and, and, you know, I, I, I don't like thinking in terms of sentiment and the short run because that tends to um, be uh, very non-predictive, but, but, I, but I am interested in seeing the, uh, how much the sentiment has turned against Bitcoin here over the last two months. And it's become very negative. And I mean, what you're saying right now, I understand all this, I'm not uh, disputing anything you said, but at the same time, this is uh, like, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly negative um, kind of backdrop. And here we are at a cycle low, if this were happening around here, uh, I'd be very concerned because it would be telling me that there's a loss of confidence, but the price is just levitating. 
Uh, whereas here we've um, had this big, um, you know, roughly 50% off uh, pretty much. And, and sentiment is uh, really negative right now. And the Bitcoin conference didn't <laughs> help that. But I actually see that as being a, um, con I'm tend to be contrarian and I see it as a contrary bullish sign, but uh, <laughs> the proof's in the pudding. I mean, this is gonna have to get back above the support for it to be bullish. That's the fact. It's, it has, there's nothing to do with sentiment. It's just a, just a, a market observation. I mean, just a very straightforward observation that right now it's, it's making a series of lower lows and it just broke a support. And there's really no other way to call it other than that's bearish. But it can turn here, but it just, it needs to uh, do that pretty quickly. And uh, if it's going to keep this um, cycle alive, uh, but it's at, a, it's at a point where it needs to turn pretty quickly. Uh, the, the others uh, though, the rest of crypto, some of them are looking pretty good. I think that um, like, like Ether is, it, it pulled back along with Bitcoin this evening, but it's it's still well above this support, which is right at about 2,500. Uh, not to mention this support, which was, this is kind of the equivalent, or, or this support here is kind of the equivalent of uh, what we're talking about with Bitcoin breaking. And uh, so the fact that this is at something like 26, or sorry, 20, 350, something like that. And um, here we are at 2620. That's pretty pretty solid um, margin over that over that level. Uh, or something like uh, Cardano, which you know it, it, although this was a resistance line, it wasn't a support line. It broke busted up through that and moved around it, but it's um, yeah, it's 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 not in a it's so above its 50-day moving average. You know, it's it's pretty. You know, I, I would say on the bull side a little bit. Um, maybe not. Maybe not a Ethereum. I'd call this neutral in this whole range. This was sort of the bubble top, but uh, in this range, it's it's kind of neutral. It could. It's pretty healthy for it to consolidate here, but but Bitcoin needs to get back up here and consolidate up here and not down continue to make these lower lows uh but uh but i think um the, you know uh, what what i'm encouraged actually by the rise of negative sentiment and even a bad conference that didn't kill it more and you know people feel free to make really negative comments it, if if bitcoin were making new highs on a daily basis there would not be People making people would say, "Wow, oh, wow, it's really moving." <laughs> How do I get in on this? Uh, but no, that's the, a um, good point about sentiment. I, I agree. What was that? Uh, that's a very good point about sentiment. It's just, uh, it's just interesting. I mean, I, you know, you, I, I think that um, this is uh, because it's such a new asset class. There aren't a lot of ways to value it. I mean, there are some valuation methods. And I've talked about them, but how do you really value it in the end confidently? You can say, I think this works. I think this is a good way to value it. Um, in which case, if you look at uh, things like this glass node, which um, that this is, is saying that Bitcoin has, uh, actually this is, I think this is, let me see if I can get more recent data here, that it's, um, uh, uh, it's actually in a pretty neutral place with with regard to uh, net unrealized profit and loss. If you look at something like the market value at a realized value, it's back at um, level step that it was at in 2019, which was uh, maybe coming out of the bear market, but it's it wasn't a full bull market at that point, or even 2018 levels. So it's right at this level here, a, a ratio of about two. Um, so is this the same as a PE for Bitcoin? No, it's not. It, it's just the, um, I think that the, um, with Ethereum, 
although there are these same um, these same statistics as what we're looking at for Bitcoin, what the most interesting ones for me are things like the uh, the the contract calls or the transaction volume because people run smart contracts on these, and so these are at levels that are they, they're continuing to rise, right? Uh, the trend is still up, even though the price has pulled off 50%, the transaction volume has kept going up. So this is, um, this, so this ends up being something like uh, a, uh, a transaction count. You know, these are pulled off a little bit, but that's um, just a um, response to the market. But then um, things like the exchange balance. So what percent of Ethereum is on exchanges? Um, that's at a, like a two year low right now. So, um, so these types of things, there's, these are, they're not like confident ways that, that you can definitely say this is, is a valuation for, for these, but they are at least fundamental statistics that can, that can point you. And, and to me, so it's saying that all of these things are saying mm -hmm. that both Bitcoin and Ethereum are kind of in a neutral place or not at bubble highs in price. Um, they pull back a lot and the, the sentiment has swung really bearish, especially on Bitcoin. And so it may, that makes me think, well, uh, that's why I'm willing to say it needs a bounce here. <laughs> uh, if, if I were um, just listening to sentiment, I mean, I'd be an all out bear right now. But the fact that some of these things are neutral it, it tells me that it it just needs to really, it needs to get back above this level. And then that will slowly allow confidence to be rebuilt. Um, but then there's some things like that, that actually uh, make me a little bit uh, more confident. Like these are negative indicators like Dogecoin uh, and failing to rally, even with um, right. today, both Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, and others rallied pretty nicely earlier today. Uh, it was a, it was a down day for for Dogecoin. I'd like to see it continue to do poorly. I think that it's you know that these all of these kind of memes uh, it, they're distractions and they take away from the seriousness of um, well, Elon the fact Musk that you're investing. You really are investing your money. I mean, uh, so go ahead. Elon Musk found another. Uh... Uh, meme coin to play with c-u-m something uh coin oh the, the cum rocket <laughs> something like that so that's yeah. what dogecoin is is uh you know yeah you uh, you you can't even you won't find that on trading view that that'll be yeah. um on you know you have to go to some alternate charting sites for that one and um but, but I think actually uh, Elon Musk kind of pumped this or he made some mention of it somewhere, believe it or not. I think he tweeted something like Canada, USA, Mexico. And I guess what he meant is this coin. And so yeah. it skyrocketed, but. Yeah, I don't know if I can. Yeah, there's this just debuted um, in the last, or just debuted on Uniswap. Um, so, um, so I don't know how much data there is, but it's um, that's the, that's the thing. There's it takes very little effort to create a um, a new coin or a new token, and you can create one with um, just minimal cost. It might cost uh, a little bit of time, maybe twenty dollars, you know, forty dollars of transaction cost. And and you can create your own coin, and 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 so there are these people that are they're like penny stock promoters, but there's not even the pretense like penny stocks. They always say, well, this will change the way that you wash your car, and they'll come up with some phony you know product that actually exists, but the company is a kind of a scam because they hired a promoter to promote their um, you know stock or whatever. But here there's not, there's not a product, there's nothing. There's nothing behind it at all. 
Whereas with um, with Bitcoin, I mean, it's it, it's got its flaws and it's got its right. it's uh, goofy side of its community, but it's it's um it, it's a store of value is what it's what its um, selling point is. Whereas Ethereum, it's that it's a platform for developing all sorts of um, applications. And but what's what's this? This is just some token that has no functionality to it. And Elon Musk keeps getting away with, with that. It's really amazing. Mm -hmm. And yet people still believe him. After the Dogecoin uh, fiasco, now they are into a new one. Right. Yeah, it's... Um... And so that's, <laughs> that's what I was meant by when I was saying there is just, just too much speculative frenzy and optimism and just craziness in the crypto space. And I meant mostly not as much Ethereum, but all of these small little silly things that just highlights the sentiment and of risk-taking for the whole uh, market in general, that to me is concerning. Yeah, I, I, I see it as a little bit, there's, um, it, it's the rise of social media is driving this, that it's not like it's inherent in the nature of crypto that there's always going to be these types of scams. These are where these originate is, yes, crypto makes it easy, but they promote this then on some pump and dump discord or on um, a um, you know, Reddit or Twitter or whatever. And then that's when people jump on and they make a double or go up by 10 X or something. So it's the, um, <clears throat> it's the, it's a social media effect, and it's also an effect of a uh, the fact that the people that are doing this they're they're generally younger. I mean, I'm Gen X. I grew up in a world that yeah you know, we uh, there was the internet when I was in college, but it was just emerging. Before that, there were services that you could go online, you could research things. But at, you know, I I part of my life was in a world where you didn't have, where you weren't intensely networked with other people. And then the more recent part of my life is in a world where we do have that. Whereas there are people uh, um, that are in Gen Z, millennials, who they've maybe not millennials, but at least Gen Z has grown up in a world where from day one, from the first time they could read, they might even have read something online the first time they read something and all of their um many, maybe half of their friends are people that they interact with primarily online and um it's uh, a, a different generational perspective and i think that um part of what's driving some of these you know, pump and dumps is it's a younger generation uh, that just has, they just have a very different view of um, like what their goals are with regard to trading and investing. And um, it's just, a, it's just and, and they can do it themselves. They, they, they don't need, they feel like that every institution is not trustworthy. So they distrust institutions. If uh, some research house or a, a bank comes out and recommends, even if they recommended a crypto or, or a specific stock that they like, they might even view that as a negative, not as a not as a positive, uh, even if it's a really well written <laughs> research report. And and so it was just this. It's a very different perspective about like how do you get information uh, that's tradable, and how do you <laughs> what do you base your decisions on? And, and they- Elon Musk tweets, of course. Right. Well, it's, um, yeah, so it's, it's um, I, what will happen, either one of two things, either it'll, it, the, the um, institutions and the systems will evolve around this. I mean, they'll, they'll feed it. <laughs> That's one outcome, I think. The other, that there is some sort of blow up or collapse and uh, like there was, let's say in 1929, uh, before that, in the 20s, you could trade stocks on the weekends. You could go down to your stock broker, trade stocks on Saturdays. There was a Saturday session. 
because there was such demand for trading. And, um, and then all that went away uh, after the crash. And so are we in a, a world like that, a pre-crash world where, and it would have to be a really, really big crash uh, to, to create that kind of social change. But yeah, I suppose it could happen. Um, but, but maybe in the near term, the more likely thing is uh, the, there's just more Robin Hoods, more, um, more companies that are taking advantage of the trend, not trying to change the trend. Thank you, Angie, as usual, for clarifying things for me. And I hope our listeners also could learn something from Andy, if not as much from me, but uh, mm-hmm. I, I just try to bring some entertaining news at least to balance out the seriousness of you. No, it's welcome. I think that uh, that you know any investment or any trade should have some skepticism around it. I mean, if the, the minute that I believe that I'm 100% right, I mean, I would never want to believe that because uh, then you're you end up like Max Kaiser, right? You, you're, you're just, um, you're totally sold on an idea. And no matter what new information you get, you're not going to change your mind. And that's a dangerous, that's dangerous when your money's involved. If it's just, um, you know, a choice of tennis shoe or something like that, or um, whatever, a style choice. Well, okay, so the worst is that you look like you're stuck in the 80s or something like that. Um, uh, nobody's going to die over it. But if but if you lose a you know a lot of money, then that's um, you could hurt your family, you could hurt yourself, and and um, a lot of consequences. So it's so it I I, I do think it's it's worth considering uh, the intelligent bearish thesis, not just the you know it's all scam kind of thing. I, I you know, it's like that to me is, um, it's not really like an argument against it, but I do think that the, um, the strongest argument against it is uh, at least what I see sometimes in Bitcoin world is a little bit of the cultishness that exists around um, the, the idea of it becoming a universal store of value for the world. And I, I think that's probably not on not likely. I think that it is likely to be more accepted as um, store of value and an investment and asset class. But um, but for that to happen, it needs to get back above support. <laughs> and it needs to be um, not just in this um, repeat another 90% off uh, air cycle. And speaking of a cultish kind of view, there was even a baptism moment at the Miami uh, Bitcoin conference where Max Kaiser was photographed uh, baptizing somebody, you know, like they do in uh, certain religious ceremonies. So that just adds the humor to that whole uh, cult. Well, yeah, that's a, so that I, I call that, you know, what I like in that too. It's like um, when I was in college, I went to because it was close to where I um, went to school. I went with some people to a Libertarian Party convention. And LP is not representative of Libertarians, but I went to this and it's like, there's some really wacky people there. You know, people come and they dress like, you know, Paul Revere and, you know, all this sort of thing. And they're walking around and, um, and talking like Paul Revere and it, it's just they're cosplaying Paul Revere and it's um, kind of you know, kind of a, it's a little it's kind of fun but it's also a little bit a little bit goofy it's sort of like not ready for prime time kind of um, shaggy dog kind of uh, um, mentality but there's, there's so there's people that deliberately they deliberately create that culture because they they like the like the un uh, they like the like the not tightly controlled corporate presentation it, and and they like the fact that it's not corporate and so they come for that and they try to stimulate that but on the other hand it's 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 odd that. Um, 
that they're, they're, the people in the Bitcoin community, they're, they're happy to get governments on board and they get companies on board that want to add it to their treasury, but then they don't want to do a corporate presentation. Right. I'm sorry, but corporate treasurers are extremely convert, conservative people. I mean, they're not like, they're not, you know, going to be impressed by the goofy stuff. They want to know, like, all right, well, is there somebody that can help me, you know, manage this position properly or hedge and, and, and so on? And they want uh, people with some financial savvy to help them do that. And, and they'd like to be able to go to a conference and meet with those sort of people. And uh, it's sort of the opposite of what you see on, on stage. So maybe it's a little bit of um, overconfidence or something that, that uh, it's, it's a little bit of a warning sign. But on the other hand, there is um, in some of the other points, there's a lot, I mean, even with Bitcoin, there's a lot of development going on. So there's, but that may be not what was on stage as much. And if I were designing the conference, that, that's what I'd put on stage is the people that are trying to make it better, improving it a little bit more nerdy and um, maybe a little bit more boring. But at the same time, it's, um, right. you know, it, it's what are you building with this? What are you, what are you doing with it? How, do you, how are you making it more useful to the people that hold it? And um, in the end, that's where the, where the value is going to come. And uh, it's, it's different than a stock. You know, the idea is that you're, you do something with it. It's active. It's an active investment. It's not like a stock that you can possibly hold for 10 years. You, you, you use it if, you, if you're doing it right. So, so that's what I think the conference should focus on is what, are, what can you use it for and how, how are we building out those um, use cases um, and also, uh, there was news today that they have recovered uh, millions in ransom from the colonial colonial pipeline uh, hackers. Do you know how they did it? Because if Bitcoin isn't untraceable, and they gave the hackers money in Bitcoin, how did the government get that money? Oh, Bitcoin is not untraceable. In fact, that's maybe one of the worst misnomers or misunderstandings is it's fully traceable. Uh, there, there are maybe ways that you can make it a lot harder for to trace it, uh, such as what's used called using a tumbler or a mixer. But even that, uh, there, there are companies that are built around um, getting working through all that. A company called Chain Analysis, and and they pride themselves on being able to figure out where the money actually went, even through a mixer. And um, uh, but. But Bitcoin is fully traceable. The, the, the blockchain is simply the record of every transaction that ever occurred from whom to whom. Now, what it is, is uh, what would, is called pseudonymous. Okay? So although, uh, although you, it, it could be anonymous in the sense of um, if I have never tied a particular Bitcoin wallet to my um, my regular finance financial um, records, like I've never, for example, bought Bitcoin on Coinbase and then sent it to that wallet. Um, in which in which case, then there's a record tying on Coinbase tying my bank account to Coinbase and then Coinbase to that wallet. So they can trace that. That's easy. Um, but then once you identify the individuals behind a wallet, then every single transaction is on the blockchain. Going back to the very first ones with Satoshi Nakamoto sending 10,000 Bitcoin to someone, you know, as, hey, try this out. And, uh, I, yeah, it's, it, it's um, every, so it's not at all untraceable. What, what is untraceable is there are cryptocurrencies that are specifically built to be non-traceable like Monero or Zcash or um, there's Dash, there are a few others that are privacy coins. And um, they do not have transaction records in the same way that Bitcoin does. But Bitcoin is 100% traceable. And the only question is, 
the degree to which you've separated your wallet from your personal finances to make it harder for someone to figure out you know, who, who is behind the wallet. But I'm, I know for a fact, I mean, just because I've, when I've created this and that, and I send something to an exchange because that's the only way to get it into dollars, um, it's, they know exactly all my, you know, if the federal government or IRS or whatever wanted to get all of my records, they, it, it's all right there. It's, there's, and, and that's true for probably 90, 98, 99% of people. The 1% are people that have um, kept some sort of distance um, and, and they would have pretty much had to go back to the very early days of Bitcoin to even have that possibility. So it's it's not untraceable uh, at all. It's it's uh, very traceable. Okay, and, I'm, uh, gonna, I'm gonna cancel all my blackmailing plans then. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it with Bitcoin. Do it with Monero if you're gonna if you're gonna do it. Um, right. It's a better one, and uh, or or like Verge. You know, some of the there's some yeah that are that are uh, those true privacy coins, but I uh, I would not. I, Bitcoin or Ethereum are not at all private in that in that sense. Uh, there are there are applications that built on top of both of them that enable some measure of privacy. On Ethereum, there's um, there's a something called Aztec that you can move Ethereum to Aztec, and then it is a privacy layer on top of um, Ethereum. But um, they, you know, if, if someone were looking at your transactions, they'd see that you moved the money to Aztec. They, they, they wouldn't be able to see what happened after that, but they'd know that you moved. If, if you move like whatever, $10,000 worth of ether there, they, well, that's, you know, you, you might have to, might get a visit from money or get a, get a, get a letter. Um, if it's if it's a hundred dollars, well, nobody's gonna care. But if it's right. ten thousand, somebody might care. Um, the government is always watching. There is no escape. That's right. No, it's oh, you know, crypto is definitely not the escape from the eyes of the government and the IRS. It's it's not at all. And people that think there are people that might have you know they didn't pay their taxes or whatever because. Coinbase or whoever wasn't reporting, or they have a wallet and make their transactions there, and there's no 1099 on your wallet. Um, but it's just a matter of time before the IRS clamps down on that, and they'll they'll they can go back in time more than three years, more than seven years. They can go back 20 years and say you didn't pay your you know 2017. Uh, but Toshi Nakamoto is not a U.S. citizen for his own sake. So, because if they find Satoshi Nakamoto, he's going to owe a lot in babe and back taxes. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. But no, probably he's already dead or, you know, non, didn't, didn't exist as a single person or something like that. But, but uh, the, um, no, there's, there's no, there's no escape um, uh, really, but, but it is, uh, but I would say that it is an experiment in a kind of mm -hmm. um, trustless um, financial transactions where you don't have a trusted intermediary um, moving the money for you. That's the trustless nature of it right. and, and that it's, it's uncensorable. So although it, it may not be untraceable, it is uncensorable. You couldn't, you, like when WikiLeaks wanted to be able to get uh, donations and not a single bank would uh, allow money to be sent to WikiLeaks, uh, you could still send Bitcoin. And so uh, they couldn't, you couldn't stop those transactions. And so they had, they got enough money to keep running because they took Bitcoin. So I think um, that's the real value of crypto is the uncensorable nature of it. Um, no matter, you know, you, and, and that could go for somebody on the left or the right or in between. <laughs> That they just, well, for whatever reason, the banking system doesn't want to support whatever it is that you 
believe in or you're you're up to and um it may be from your standpoint completely benign but um but that's that's where um where people have found a lot of value in this as an alternative to that that system where it's, it's tightly controlled yeah well thank you very much and we'll see on wednesday what happens to bitcoin pricing and other let's see let's see if we can bounce here all right thank thanks everyone